Well, hey, hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Amazing Seller Podcast. This is episode number 716, and today I am excited for a couple of different reasons. Actually, a few different reasons. Number one, I get to hang out with someone that I've been wanting to hang out with on the podcast for a very long time, and we finally made it happen, and that person is Tony Anderson. You may know who she is from a very well-known conference out there called Seller's Summit, who is also partnered with Steve Chu on that on that event, uh, but also she's a 13-year blogger as of this year, which is just crazy. So she has seen it all as far as where blogging was. And if you don't know what blogging is, it used to be where it was just like you could publish, hey, this is what I'm doing today. It's really evolved into content where people are posting content on a regular basis. And I don't mean it has to be daily. It could be weekly. It could be monthly, whatever, but it's a way for them to put out content and it's really evolved over the years. But the one thing that has not changed is that the content that is really good and that is serving a market or solving a problem or answering a question is still going to do really well. So I wanted to get her on because, well, she's been around the blogging world for a while. I wanted to talk about content creation. I wanted to talk about what has changed over the years, what we should be doing differently now. Also, she talked about, which I didn't know this at the time, that she's actually in the in the middle of a content audit, and I personally wanted to know a little bit more about that. And we just go into a lot of different areas of content creation. And then the other thing I wanted to say, which I'm really excited about, is Tony is going to be one of our speakers at Brand Accelerator Live. So depending on when you're listening to this, all right, that event is coming up really soon. This episode is airing approximately three weeks before that event. Now, if you have not grabbed your ticket, one new reason why you should be attending is because Tony is going to be there talking about not just content creation, but content amplification, how to take a piece of content and get it out there to the masses, how to leverage other networks that are now available to us and really not how to work harder, but smarter with that piece of content. And she's going to go into several different ways to make this happen. So again, if you've not grabbed your ticket yet and you wanted to attend, if this is before the time of the event, Head over to BALtickets.com. There still is a handful of tickets as a time of recording this episode. Again, when this airs, there might not be, but here's the deal. Still go over there because we will be having virtual tickets available. As soon as they are, you will be notified of that when you go to BALtickets.com. So that's another reason to go there, even if the event is sold out or if it's over with. So definitely go over to BALtickets.com for all of that. But I'm super excited that she's going to be there uh, for this event. And I'm excited to hear more about her amplification strategies that she's using on a regular basis. And again, she's been doing it for 13 years, guys. Like, it's just going to be amazing. So, all right. With that all being said, the show notes to this episode, which you're probably going to want to go and check out because we drop a lot of links and a lot of just different things that we're talking about. I'm going to link that all up inside of that post. So this way it's here. It's easy for you to locate everything that we talk about. And that's the amazing seller.com forward slash 716. All right. So again, Get ready to learn more about content creation, why you still should be paying attention to that, and it's probably even more important now than it was 13 years ago, all right, and how you can adapt this to your business now in 2019 and into the future, all right? So, guys, sit back, relax, enjoy this session with Tony Anderson. Well, hey, Tony, welcome to the podcast. This is a long time coming. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. (laughs) This has been so long coming. You and I have been talking about getting you on the podcast for probably almost two years now, to be honest. Yes. Yes. It has been that long. And uh, we finally, uh, we finally made it happen. Uh, What's, what's going on in your world these days? I mean, after your big conference and, you know, doing your, your own businesses, like what's, what's happening right now for you? So I'm actually in the middle of a huge blog audit. I don't know if your Mm -hmm. audience is familiar with blog audit, you know, doing a blog audit and things like that. But since my blog is 13 years old, mm-hmm. I'm trying to sort of pare down the content. I've been hit by a couple of the Google updates. So just trying to hone in on really topic niche specific things on my blog and deleting a lot of the content that I wrote 10 to 12 years ago, that's not really relevant anymore. So that's sort of been my whole summer. 
That's interesting, actually. And uh, I didn't know that you were working on that, but that's great that you're talking about that because today I want to talk about content. You've been blogging for a very long time. And uh, some people think that blogging is dead and email marketing is dead. And I love that when I hear that because it's like, no, it's really not. It's actually, to me, it's probably better now than ever. And uh, it's one of those things when people are zigging and you want to zag or whatever the saying is, uh, you know what I mean? And and for you to go through and, and you, you've been in this in this world for a very long time, as far as the blogging space and content creation, and you've seen all those updates. So I definitely want to dig into that. And I'm excited that you're going to be uh, this year, depending on when people are listening to this, you're going to be one of our speakers at Brand Accelerator Live, our first ever event. And uh, you're going to be talking about amplifying content, which I think is, is going to be interesting. But I want to dig into that after towards the end, because selfishly, I want to know what the heck you're doing on a blog audit and what you look for in some of these updates. But why don't you let the listeners that don't know who Tony Anderson is, give us a little bit of a background of, uh, of who you are, where you kind of come from as far as like the online space and then how you got to where you are today. All right. Well, I actually, and I don't know if you know this about me, I got my start selling on eBay That's back nothing. in back in 1999 before there were digital cameras or, you know, I would, we would, I would get items. I would have the pictures developed. I would then scan them, upload them. <laughs> I <laughs> so that's actually how I got my start. I've always, I have children. I've always wanted to have uh, jobs and opportunities that allowed me to stay home with them and be really flexible. Mm. So that was my first sort of foray into the world of digital marketing uh, back when eBay was a baby. And yeah. I did that for a couple of years. I really liked it. And it's funny because I ended up full circle with products later on, right? But yeah. Uh, and then probably fast forward a couple years into like early 2000s and I found this thing called blogging and I thought, Hey, this is really cool. I can write really about my kids. And I thought, well, if my mom reads it, I'll be successful. <laughs> and <laughs> which is probably how a lot of bloggers started out. And I started blogging and I was just writing random things about my family and my kids and little observations I would make throughout my days as a sort of stay-at-home mom. And one day I get a very random phone call from a lady who claims to be Oliver North's publicist or assistant. I don't remember what it was. And I don't even think we had cell phones back then. And so I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Thanks so much. Well, then she persisted and sent me an email, I think, and followed up with another phone call. And she actually wanted to use one of my articles in, in his like newsletter publication that he had. Wow. And it was that light bulb moment where I thought, well, if Oliver North knows who I am, uh, maybe there's something bigger in this blogging world than just writing to my mother. So, <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I didn't know that story. Yeah. So anyway, I gave him permission to use my content and I had written a post on 4th of July and it was sort of like a tribute to our military veterans and he wanted to use it. I think he must have had like a monthly newsletter or something like that. I don't, to this day, I didn't even see it. Okay. But in exchange for that, he sent me an autographed copy of his book. And oh, that's awesome. And that was uh, that was my first realization that, hey, blogging it could be something big. But this was back in like 2006. Okay. Then, uh, you know, WordPress and Blogger, they mm -hmm. were they weren't just getting started, but they were still in their infancy, infancy I would say. Mm -hmm. And it, at that moment, I kind of pivoted and I thought, okay. I think I can turn this into a business. I'm not a bad writer. I could, you know, everyone can improve on their skills, but I thought I could definitely take this and make this into something much bigger. And so that's when I sort of realized this was going more from a sharing my personal diary to, hey, I can teach people things online and maybe figure out how to make money from it. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, the one word that you just said that resonates with me a lot, and I know that you understand this as well as pivoting, right? And you've yeah. kind of seen this pivot um, happening and what you learned through, through each thing that you've done. Let me go back to the eBay day though. Their days. <laughs> I, I just got to ask you a question about that because uh, that's exactly what I did. Like that was like my I think my first dollar ever made online was selling like something I was going to get rid of, and I think it was if I can remember correctly, it was a software that allowed you to run Windows uh, Windows machine like software on a Mac. 
It was like Parallel, okay. I think it was called. Yes, I, I had that. Yeah, me too. And so I bought it. I think I paid a hundred bucks for it or 120 bucks. And I ended up selling it for like $70 after I was done, you know, basically having to do the switch because now Mac really made it easy for you to run stuff on there. Uh, and uh, so I ended up selling it for like 70 bucks and I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait a minute, I just sold something to someone in another state. Like mm -hmm. garage sales is when I, the only time I could ever sell anything like was used. And, um, and then that got my wheels spinning as well. But so what was the first, do you remember what the first thing is that you sold on eBay? I do. So I, I love garage, even to this day, I love garage sales. Yeah. I, I just can't resist when I drive by, but back in the late 1990s, we just, we didn't have a lot of money as a family. So we were using it basically to find furniture and toys for our kids yeah. and, we were out yard selling one day and there was this, and I don't, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like a old gambling punch board. And basically it was probably like two feet by one feet and it had all these little holes in it. And you could, I don't know how they played the game, but basically you would punch out these little holes and you could win things. Okay. And this board actually had like a pinup girl on it. And <laughs> nice. it was, it looked really like no one had ever punched any of the holes out. Okay. And they wanted like 25 cents for it. And my husband and I looked at each other and we're thinking, okay, because I had, you know, I had, I'd bought stuff on eBay, but I'd never sold anything. Right. And we looked at each other and we thought, okay, this, this has got to be worth something more than 25 cents. And we're thinking if we could sell this for 10 bucks, right? right, right. You know, we're rich. That, that's right. a nice ROI. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it sold for like $55, right? Oh my gosh. Because it's, it was an, and of course today it's probably worth so much more, right? I'm probably kicking myself. Yeah, and so right. that, that was my, you know, hey, this is something that I can do. And then the next thing that I bought was a pair of Siamese cat salt and pepper shakers <laughs> for five cents. Some older woman was like, you know, cleaning out her house. Well, those sold on eBay for like $105 because oh, I guess gosh. people collect cats and salt shakers. So it's a good combination. And that was sort of the moment where I became like every Friday and Saturday morning, I'd put my two kids in the car. I had like this old time TV VCR combo that plugged into the cigarette lighter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and they would watch movies all Friday and Saturday morning while we would just, I would hit every yard sale within like 30 miles of my house and just look for, look for potentials. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting that you, you went down that road. And I think a lot of people when getting started, uh, either dabbled in eBay or even nowadays you have Facebook marketplace and stuff that you yeah. can kind of flip stuff pretty easily. But, uh, yeah. Had, did, did I tell, have I ever told you like the bridge story uh, that I no. sold? The, the cedar bridges. So my, my wife and I, we were photographers and, uh, she was mainly the photographer. I was just the guy that made funny faces and get the kids to smile. Uh, but so she was always looking for props and stuff for our studio. And there was these little garden bridges, little four foot garden cedar bridges that, uh, the Christmas tree shop would sell. Have you ever heard of the Christmas tree shop? Do they have them in Florida? Yes. My aunt yeah. actually works there. So okay. I'm very familiar with it. You know what it is. It's just a yeah big store with just a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and so she would always go there probably weekly or every other week and look and see if she could find any unique props. And so she's seen the cedar bridge. It was un, you know, stained. It was just raw wood. And, um, she was, um, she was actually looking at it. She's like, this is really good. She goes, but you know, I think I'm just going to go on eBay and buy one and just see there if I can get it for a better deal. Well, she went there and it was actually selling for $130, but at Christmas tree shop, it was selling for $25. And she's like, Scott, I think, I mean, you just sold that thing on eBay. Maybe we should try to sell this bridge for a hundred bucks. And I'm like, yeah, all right. So we did brought a home, listed it. And we were doing the bid by, you know, bidding back then. Yes. And uh, yeah, I started getting bids like immediately and it sold for like $130. Long story short, we brought the minivan back. We had the minivan at the time, <laughs> brought the minivan back and we loaded that thing up with as many bridges. as I think they had 25 of them. We bought them. They were 25 bucks a piece, brought them home. We listed them all and we were selling those things for probably a good solid year. Uh, we actually paid for our kids tuition to a private school with that money, um, which is just crazy. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it was just, it just kind of happened. You know what I mean? But it was like, we seen almost like, almost like retail arbitrage without even knowing what we were doing. Right. You know, right. It's funny. Do you remember, this is one thing I remember doing. And if this is back, like I had dial up internet when I was doing this. Yes. Of and course. When you, when your auction was ending, you yeah. would keep hitting the refresh to see if the bids were going up. Yes, it, was, yes. it, was, it was like an addiction. I it mean, I would sit there and just refresh, refresh, refresh. And of course it would take like 35 to 40 seconds for the page <laughs> to refresh. But yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I totally it was a good time. No, it was. And you know, it's funny. I, 
I mean, people ask me all the time, like I had a buddy just recently the other day and he's like, you know, Hey, I, I, I see what you're doing. And I, I really like, I just want, I would make a few extra bucks. Like, what do you think? You think I should launch a private label product? And I go, no, I think you should go and find some stuff and flip it on eBay. Like that's the <laughs> easiest way without having any risk. And you can just go there, buy one thing and flip it. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, like why reinvent the wheel? Like you're having a garage sale in a sense, but you're having it online with a whole bunch of people. Yeah. And like, really? And I'm like, yeah, really? Uh, so yeah, I'm still a fan of eBay. If you just want to go out there and make a few extra bucks, my son actually was selling VCRs. I, he's like, I want to go to garage sales and find stuff. I go, just look for VCRs and flip them. He was finding them for like 10 bucks and selling them for like 75 to hundred bucks. VCRs. Uh, yeah. Which is crazy. Anyway, that's eBay. And that's kind of where everyone kind of gets their start. It seems. Uh, so let's talk about the blogging real quick. Cause I do want to jump into content creation and, and really where you see that going and maybe some tips and, and things that people could be using today, you know, not uh, 13 years ago when you started this, this blogging thing. So uh, let, let's talk about the blogging thing. You started more broad, just mm-hmm. kind of randomly. Where, when did you start to say, you know what, I, I need to narrow this or I need to niche this down? Or did you, or did you just say, I'm just going to keep randomly throwing stuff out there? So I'm probably a little bit of an anomaly in this because I do believe that you should niche down in your topics when you're mm-hmm. blogging. I've never done it. Okay. (laughs) Um, But I've never done it because it doesn't, it's not me. And I've always believed, and this is sort of one of my like core beliefs when it comes to business is you have to work in sort of your passion area or the things that you really believe in, because when it starts to suck for you, if you're not super passionate about what you're doing, you're going to give up. So for me, I could never decide. I was super passionate about my family and I was super passionate about budgeting and I'm super passionate about cooking, right? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just write about cooking because for me, I also wanted to talk about like how I potty trained my kids because that was important to me. And people would ask me about that. So I sort of, my side is more of just a global home management. So basically anything in your house, I'm going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how to buy a car, right? Because that's not the same thing. But so for me, I didn't niche down. But for most people to have success, you have to get a little more specific. So Mm -hmm. you don't have to be so specific that you're only going to talk about, you know, Instapot recipes, right? Right. You can talk about cooking globally, but you'll do better. And you'll, especially if you're starting out from zero, if you're going to talk about, if you you love to cook, if you want to talk about recipes, you can get on the table in 20 minutes or less. You're going to do much better in the long run, mm. then if you just said, oh, I'm just going to put up every recipe that I've ever enjoyed. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, it, it is hard to, uh, to really dial in that one, I guess that one direction because people feel then they get locked in. But I also think that you could start niche and then build out of the niche and go more broad. So I always use the, you know, the bass fishing example, but if you went into like hunting and fishing, and then you just took those two verticals and then went, okay, I'm going to go into fishing, but then I'm going to narrow down into fishing, into bass fishing, and then maybe even one more layer and go into kayak bass fishing. Now we're talking, we're really drilling down into those sub niches, but then we can also back out of it as, as long as we didn't name our site best kayak bass fishing or something. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. So for sure. So for people that are, that are listening, that maybe already have uh, a, some, somewhat of a brand. I, and I say that because a lot of people are having their business built on just one channel and that's Amazon. And mm-hmm. they've been listening to the podcast now for over a couple of years, uh, and, and heard, you know, probably that I'm really focusing on how to build a brand and not just a Amazon selling business. Um, and so because of that, like if someone has that already, what would you say for them to take their you know, their existing channel, let's just say that they are, I mean, I've got people right now and actually there's someone that was at seller summit. Um, and, um, I actually, I think I just posted his voicemail, but he gave me a long voicemail just about how, how excited he was about the event seller summit. Again, another little shout out to seller summit. Um, but, um, and he said that, you know, the thing that I really need help with is I'm doing really good on, on Amazon, you know, high six, maybe even seven figures, but that's it. And I don't have that external stuff. Like, what do we do in order to make sure that we can secure more of our business and our brand, not just on that one channel? And I know that you do believe in content. So what would you advise someone that already might have something established and they don't really have any type of content or anything created? Where would you tell that person to start? 
I would probably start with a blog. I mean, I would start with the, just the general content creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously it varies by what you sell, Mm -hmm. but I'm, and I'm I'm not super familiar with your listeners. I know that they love Amazon Mm -hmm. and I would, if you sell multiple, because I know a lot of people sell multiple products on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. They don't just stick in one niche, but I would definitely, if you, if that is you, I would definitely find your most profitable niche or the one that you feel like the best content can be created for it. Mm -hmm. There's some things that I think you can create content for anything, but obviously there are certain things that are way easier to create content for. And then I would start creating content that either talks about how to integrate the products into your lifestyle or how to use those products to solve a problem, Mm. right? So say we actually, I think someone at Seller Summit sells sprinkler parts, right? So that's pretty uninteresting when you think about it. Right. Uh, But you could start creating content in how to use the parts because I feel like if you're buying sprinkler parts, depending, I don't know if this guy wholesales or retails, but if he's retailing, people that are buying these want to learn how to fix their own sprinkler, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a treasure trove of content right there on which heads do you buy? How do you install them? How do you keep them from spraying your front door, right? right? So you could start creating content all around just how to do DIY your own sprinkler system. Mm. And then in that content, obviously you can talk about your products and you can link to your products and you can recommend your products. And so that's probably where I would get started is creating that content. And I say blog, but depending on the topic, you might want to do video, mm. right? Which I, I sort of consider, consider all content creation because if I had a video, I would put it on a blog, right? I wouldn't just let it live on YouTube or Facebook, I would integrate it in blog content as well. Right. Yeah. No. And just to kind of give you a heads up on, on the audience, we we definitely have been really uh, hammering on finding your niche, finding your market, and then from there creating uh, whether it's assets or resources to help those you know those people, but then also align products that could be sold uh, to the same customer. Uh, right. I think you agree, right? It's like easier to sell that same customer something else that would add on to their order than it is to say, oh, I'm going to go over here and do something in crocheting and then I'm going to do something in fishing and then I'm going to do something in cooking. Um, it's so, it, to me, it's harder because then your focus is split, but it's kind of like the, you know, the, uh, you know, the spray effect where they're trying to just go ahead and say, oh, well, this is a hot selling product. So I'm going to try to sell that. But then you have nothing that can really build around that to then bring attention to your brand or your business other than the product. So to me, it just makes it a lot harder. But a lot of my listeners over the past two years have been hearing me talk about that. And that is what we are focusing on. So that's why, again, with what you're saying, 100% agree. Now, okay, so content, we talk about content and we talk about different how to's and we talk about maybe questions that do you, I mean, is written content still something that you would say is important and is Google still friendly enough to allow us to be seen? Yes, absolutely. And I think, especially now, I don't, we can't get into an SEO lesson here and I'm sure you can have someone who knows way more about SEO than I do mm-hmm. on the podcast. So you probably yeah, yeah. have already, but the more, that's why niching down is really helpful, right? Because if you want to try to rank for cooking, good luck right? But if you want to try to rank for a long tail, just like your kayak bass fishing, right? Right. So you're probably going to have a much easier time ranking for very niche down terms than you are for global, like how to fish. Mm. But so I think that's one of the keys with Google. And it's interesting because I talk about pivoting, right? But some of my most popular posts, the posts that still rank on Google are 10 years old. Wow. Because at the because at the end of the day, good content is good content. And that's what Google cares about, right? Mm-hmm. They care about relevant content so that when people search and they land on your site, they're getting the answers to their questions or they're getting a solution to your problem. So if you're writing good stuff, it, it'll stand the test of time. Now, you might have to do tweaks to content where you go back, okay, Google really likes header, heading tags, right? Where when I started... Google didn't care about heading tags, right? I don't, actually don't even think that was an option in WordPress. But mm-hmm. so you can go in and tweak to make it more friendly. You know, it used to be shorter content. Now it's really long content, you know, almost 2,000 words. So you can go add to the content, but the core content is the same. Mm. Okay. So, okay. So Google, again, I mean, they've done plenty of updates. And again, it's we're, we're talking about another channel, right? We don't technically own that. We do own the content, but we don't necessarily own like the position uh, that we get from, from ranking and, and getting the search results and stuff. But 
what do you feel about like, I, I know that backlinks are like really important and like there's, there's certain SEO like tricks. And again, we're not going to get into all that stuff, but it sounds like to me, like you're just, and, and again, you've been doing it for years. It's kind of like, I'm going to write about what people are asking for and I'm going to give them the answer and I'm not going to worry about doing all of this other stuff. I mean, the basics, of course, I mean, you install like a plugin that probably gives you like the checklist of like Yoast has like a checklist that you can kind of go through and go, okay, make sure all my tags are in there. Make sure all my, you know, whatever is, is optimized the best as possible, but you're not really like spending like hours and hours trying to optimize for, uh, for getting backlinks or any of that stuff. Or are you? No, I'm definitely not spending hours and hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't have hours and hours. Uh, I, I think it's important. So here's where I would say that I do spend a little bit of time. I spend a little time figuring out what I want to, what keywords I want to target for. Okay. So I have a post that's popular on my site about how to kill ants, which is kind of crazy, but it's been one of my most popular posts for a really long time. And mm. so it's, it's okay to spend a little time in a keyword tool to find out how are people searching for that? Because how to kill ants is pretty broad, but when you niche down to like how to kill ants with borax or how to kill ants naturally, things like that, you might find some opportunity there. So I do spend a little time crafting the exact terminology that I want to use and try to rank for, but that's about all that I do aside from creating good content, making it easy to read, basic, you know, SEO principles, which obviously Yoast has a checklist. There's probably other uh, plugins that do the same thing, right. but that's that's where I do spend a little bit of time is sort of keyword mapping. Mm. But outside of that, I just tried. I've always my rule has been just create really good content that people want to read. Mm. Yeah, I I agree. And you know, again, I mean, and you've seen this. I know you have because there's been these Google updates. Is you see all of the sites that have done the black hat type, you know, building blog networks and then linking to themselves. And then all of a sudden, Google does an update and all of a sudden they get de-indexed, right? Like, and that's the thing that I think that the cream always rises to the top. And in this case, if you just continually put out really good content, follow the rules, then you should be okay. And as far as like putting out content, and I know people listening, are, they get a little nervous about creating that content, but like how frequently would you say that you should be putting out content in order to even, you know, get out there and get some traffic. So this is actually where things have pivoted, right? Because 10 years ago, most people were putting out content every day. Mm. But then what happened was, is that people, your, your readers, the people that become your, your people mm -hmm. can't consume that much content because I don't know about you, but I follow a lot of marketers, right? Mm -hmm. And they usually email you once a week because that's about all you can consume from a a, a certain pro product or person. Sure. So I think if you're putting out once a week, you're probably good. You, I would even say you could go to twice a month. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but the problem is initially, if you're just starting out and you have zero, you do need to have some content back in there, right? So don't start from zero, put out one post every, every other week and think, oh, it's been two months. I have four items. Why am I not? Why am I not? No one's finding me mm -hmm. because you don't have any history there, right? But I think nowadays, you know, once a month, once every other week is probably sufficient. Mm -hmm. If your content's long form, you know, we're talking 2000 words or more. Right, right. Okay. And so the other question, I know I get a lot of people that, that ask, like, does my content have to be like perfect? You know, does it have to be like, I'm not really a good writer? Uh, you know, so how do you help someone or advise someone that's saying, I can't write content. I'm not good at it. So I actually, I don't think everyone can write content well, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one, you could take a copywriting course. They're pretty inexpensive, a couple hundred dollars. That will greatly improve your writing. Two, maybe you're just not a good writer and you hate to write. You might be better on video. You might be better on a podcast. And you can take that content. I don't want to give away all of our brand accelerator stuff, but <laughs> you, can, you can take that content and have someone else craft it into a post for you, Right. Uh, so the written content, you don't, you don't have to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say not everybody is cut out to write content. Some people are just aren't good writers and that's okay because you're probably really good at something else. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, I, it's funny. I don't know if you know this, but when you gave your talk this year at Seller Summit, Steve had never been in a uh, in one of your talks live. Yeah. He had always listened to the recording. And I get a text from him five minutes in. Scott is amazing. He has so much energy on stage. It's like phenomenal, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm like, yeah, where have you been? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, right. <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying you're not a good writer, but I'm saying you're really good live in front of people. Right. That, that is definitely something that you're amazing at. So if that's, you know, for your listeners, if they're really good at just talking and getting on a microphone and talking about their product, that's okay to have someone else take that, your verbal content and make it into written content. Right. So, but I would say if you think you're a decent writer, I would invest in some sort of a copywriting or writing, even at your local community college, you can take a writing class Mm -hmm. for, you know, a couple hundred dollars, probably. I don't know how much community colleges cost these days, but hopefully they're still affordable. Uh, (laughs) Who knows? Yeah. But I would definitely, yeah, I would definitely educate yourself a little bit because I don't think it has to be perfect. And I, you know, for those people that have sort of that, I'm a perfectionist. I have a hard time getting stuff out that I'm just not in love with, but you don't want to sit on stuff because it's not what you think is a hundred percent. Yeah. I've actually fallen into that trap of like not wanting to publish because it's not perfect. Uh, and I've found that once I, once I got past that, and I think it's just been again, from other people that I've either followed or mentors or whatever that just said, listen, like it's going to be good enough. And I'm not saying put out crap, but you definitely got to find what is going to allow you to be consistent. Cause I think consistency is everything. Yep. If, if you just put out one piece of content and then three months from now, I'll do another piece. And like you were saying, I think you have to backfill. If you're starting yep. from scratch, you have to, you have to backfill. And, and that could be, like you said, it could be with video, it could be with audio. Um, and like you said, I am definitely better on video and being in that live or almost live, you know, environment where I can actually get excited and show people that I'm, I'm really passionate about what I'm talking about, but it's funny. I've got a clip, which I think I might share at brand accelerator live yet. I haven't developed all of my presentation stuff, but I think I want to add this one clip because my wife and I were trying to shoot a video. I was trying to shoot a video for our photography studio talking about, why people should have us do their pictures because we're capturing moments that are going to be, you know, there forever. And we're capturing a moment in time and all this stuff. And I literally could not shoot the video. Like we never published the video because I I couldn't get through it. And I kept getting frustrated. And, um, and now I can, you know, get on video pretty easily and even jump on a podcast and do it. But also because I've done it right. And I've, I just consistently done it writing. I don't like writing. Okay. But there's ways around that. Number one, write more, you'll get better. (laughs) Like like you said, right? Like, so I write a Friday email. My Friday emails have gotten a lot better than the first one. A lot better. I get people that email me go, Oh my gosh, you write so great. And I'm like, really? Like, but I've learned, you know, through, you know, through the years of doing that. And it's like the old saying practice makes perfect because it does, but you do have to consistently show up. And one little hack that I've done is like, for example, like I've wanted to put out like a free piece of content for the TAS audience, like a guide of some kind. And I have one right now. It's Ecom Biz Book, which is basically taking everything through the, the validation stage of a market and, you know, how to, find your market, but then how to establish if it's even worth going into. And then from there, building out like product line and all that stuff. But I didn't want to write that. So I just recorded four episodes of the podcast, mapped everything out. And then I had it all transcribed and then edited. And then, and not just the transcript, but basically edited into a book form. And so I paid someone to do that, but I was able to get it all out of me by hitting record. So again, that's another tip for anyone that's listening. Cause I know it's a big hang up for people. And you know, I, I understand that. 100%. Um, Let's talk about monetization though, okay? Because you're you're publishing content and then when does it, when did, like you you publish the one piece and you're like, oh, you know, uh, you know, I got someone famous to want to, but that didn't really bring you money, right? No. (laughs) When did money, when did money come into the equation here? Oh, I was actually trying to think about this the other day. I think I blogged for probably two to three years before I saw any money, but I wasn't also blogging very consistently. Mm -hmm. So when I sort of drilled down and said, okay, I'm going to try to make a living out of this, it was probably 10 months before I, I think I made like $52 from AdSense or something. (laughs) Nice. Uh, we, I joke that like AdSense, everyone has their first check from AdSense that's like yeah. $17. But uh, it you know, just depends. Uh, I think you have to have consistent content. You have to be 
out there in, in engaging with people and you have to figure out how you're going to make money. I would say if you're creating content around your own products, I would be more hesitant to be promoting other things and distracting mm. people. Uh, I don't know if I'm sure your listeners have been on websites, any news site, you see ads all over their pop-up ads, their leak mm. ads at the bottom. Right? So for me, if it's content for people to buy my product, the only ads that they're going to see on that page are ads for my own product. Like I make them look like display advertising, right? Mm. So they don't really know that they're seeing it, but the only thing they're ever going to be able to click on is my stuff. Mm. So if you're doing this really specifically for your own products, I would stay away from trying to monetize a lot of content outside of your own products, because what you don't want to do is take them somewhere else Person, my opinion is mm-hmm. you don't want to take them somewhere else. Now, that, that's not to say that you couldn't, you know, create this content and then build up a community that you might charge money for in the future, right? So, say you're a bass fish, fisherman, you love kayaking, you get this, you write these articles, you get this content, and then eventually, what you do is create a membership group where people are paying nine ninety nine a month or twenty nine ninety nine a month to get the absolute best of the best, right? And that's your content that you're saving for your premium customers. Mm. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think even more so now uh, with social media and everything, I, I definitely think that the community play is big. Uh, and it's not easy because, again, it requires more work and all of that stuff. But there's so much noise out there that if you can build that community uh, within, like you said, like your your blog. And I, I call it a blog, but I actually call it our home base because the, the blog can be the website where people can go. They can also find your store. They can also find other resources. Um, and so just when people hear blog, they're like, oh, it's just you kind of writing all the time. And it's like, yes, but it's really a collection of information. Or I like to tell people like make, create the best resource for your market and it all lives at your home base. Um, so let's talk about this audit really quickly. I want to know exactly what the heck you're doing after 13 years and where do you even start? Because I'm even seeing that with, and we've talked about this myself and my team and after Brand Accelerator Live, after that event's done, um, we're going to be going back to the, to the drawing board a little bit of like some things that we got to clean up. And one of them is, uh, is our website, even just, uh, you know, TAS stuff. Like, so what are you doing? Like, what's the first pass? Like, what are you doing to clean things up. And I think anyone listening right now, even if you have a, a site that's a year or two old, you might even want to consider this. Yeah. So it, it's my personal nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I can my, imagine. My close friends have heard me scream over this for, I've been doing it for about a year because okay. I haven't, I mean, I'd have to lock myself in a room for probably a good month to do this all at one time. Mm. Uh, when I started, I had 13,000 posts. Oh my God. So, yeah. So that's kind of nightmarish in itself. So you know, it's very simple. I started with an export of the content. I ran some tools. So I use like Screaming Frog and Ahrefs to run content. Now, the problem with running these tools for me is that while I do get a decent amount of traffic from Google, I get a lot of traffic from Pinterest. Mm. So uh, Ahrefs is not going to show me that this, it's going to show me a post doesn't rank in Google, but I might be getting 10,000 page views a week from Pinterest on this Mm -hmm. post. So I'm sure not going to delete it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's bringing me revenue just from display advertising and things like that. So, but because I got hit by some of the Google updates, one of the big reasons was my site speed was slow. So I fixed that. But then another reason was a lot of my content was really short because back when I was writing 10 years ago, 300 word posts were totally fine. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did, which is sort of like a quick win is I removed or de-indexed or put to draft any post that was under 300 words. Okay. And the ones that I felt like could not even be revived, right? So there wasn't enough content there to even make it into a thousand plus word posts. They just got deleted. Okay. So that was step one. Uh, To give you perspective, I started with 13,000. I'm now at about 2,000 posts. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a heck of a cleanup. Yeah. (laughs) But a lot of that was, so maybe I had, you know, six posts on my site in different years on how to use natural cleaners, but Mm -hmm. they all had a different angle. So those all got combined into one big post, right? So now that post is 2,500 words. It, I'm, you know, being much more focused on SEO and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I did. The next thing I did was remove, and this might not be super relevant to your audience, but I did a lot of brand ambassadorships 
where I would partner with companies and they would pay me a flat rate to talk about their products, obviously all related to the website. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if they were five years old, then they just, they got deleted because, you know, I'm giving them follow links that I don't need to give them. And the content wasn't always like 100% relevant with sort of my home management site. So those, most of those posts, anything that was like sponsored got deleted because those do give you a little bit of a ding. Okay. Um, And then I just removed posts that got no traffic. So they got no traffic from Google. They didn't get traffic from Pinterest. They weren't well-written. They couldn't be revived. Uh, And it was actually kind of funny because for a long time, I had a lot of writers back when you put content out every day. There's no way I could do that personally. So I had a team of like 25 writers for my site. Oh my gosh. And so I told Steve, actually, I said, this is actually really frustrating to be deleting posts that I paid for. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, um, but I knew that those posts weren't bringing any value to my site. They didn't rank. There wasn't like a clear way I could get them to rank. Uh, you know, there wasn't a clear, clear like keyword or message in the post. So those went too. So that's, so right now I'm at the like 2000 posts that I want to keep, but a lot of them just need updated because they were written 10 years ago. So maybe, I mean, when I started blogging, people wrote recipes without photos. Mm-hmm. Which is unheard. If you are any, if you ever go on a recipe on Google, they all have photos, step by step. They're oh, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, when I got started, you had no photos, and then you took them with your phone, right? So, you know, a lot of my stuff just needs updating with gotcha. current practices, basically. And isn't that a little scary though? Because you have content that's there, and you're like, oh, if I take that away, is that going to take any traffic? Because maybe it is, and even though I'm not seeing it, it, is there any of that fear that goes through your mind? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and it was hard too, because when I started, a lot of my posts were, my kids were in a lot of the posts, even though it wasn't about them, I used them as my props. Mm. And so I told Steve, I said, because he's been my biggest crying, the pillow that I've cried on through this. Yeah. I was like, I can't delete pictures of my kids. You know? I know, right, right. And he's like, just no index them. And I was like, oh yeah, you should have told me that 10,000 posts ago. But uh, <laughs> so I actually moved a lot of content like that over to a private site just so I have it personally. Gotcha. But at the end of the day, my kids are older now. A lot of them don't want their pictures all over the internet. Mm. So, you know, for their privacy too, it, it, it's better. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been a process, but I would recommend, honestly, even if you only have a two-year-old blog, go through. If you have a post you wrote two years ago that's not ranking and doesn't get any traffic, you might want to figure out maybe why it's not ranking. But then two, it might be worth deleting because mm-hmm. it's not helping you just to be sitting there. And so like you were mentioning, like to put it in draft mode, does that, does that mean that that de-indexes that? Like, how does that work? Or would you physically delete it? So I put the stuff in draft that I just couldn't bring myself to delete personally. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah, definitely. It definitely de-indexes the post. Okay. Uh, Okay. But yeah, draft was sort of my baby step to deletion. Okay. Uh, How do I feel about it in the morning after I've done that? Oh, I can bring it back if I want to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Complete. But it's (laughs) funny, the longer this goes on, the more ruthless I'm getting, you know? Because I'm so over it. I'm like, I don't even care anymore. Delete, delete, delete. Oh, that is that is funny. But I could totally see that too. You're like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to, but I know I need to. Uh, now you talked about site speed real quick. And I know that is a big one. What did you do really quickly? I mean, you don't have to go into all the details. What is something that you did there to speed that up? Was it a new theme? Was it, uh, you know, plugins? Like what was it? Well, so plugins slow your site down. So okay. I did a plugin audit okay. of... And I'm a, I'm a heavy plugin user, I, mm-hmm. there, but there should be an uh, anonymous group for us. <laughs> so I, went, I went through and got rid of as many as I could that were not absolutely necessary for my site. The other thing that was slowing my site down were images. Mm-hmm. So back when, you know, when I started, you didn't use images and you used them and you never thought about compressing them or resizing them. So I did install a plugin that compressed my images, which sort of goes against the deleting the plugin thing. Uh, but I'm now working on deleting and resizing images as well. So for me, those were two of the biggest factors. There were also some things I actually hired somebody off Upwork to make some modifications in my code that there's no way I could possibly do myself that sped it up. But I went from, I don't know if you've used like the GT metrics site yep. or, yeah, yeah. You know, I went from an F to a BA depending. Oh, wow. That's great. So, yeah. Another thing that was really slowing my site down was, and if you ever, I don't know if you ever talk about ad networks, but yeah, we do. 
so if you have an ad network, they all want to put video players on your site. Well, mm-hmm. those are just like turtles for you. Mm. So if that's not making you a significant amount of money to have those ad players on there, I would recommend removing them. Just remove them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's smart. But I, I know site speed is a big one because if people come there and they can't load the thing, they're gone. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, you know, a potential sale or even just, uh, you know, revenue from the ad networks. What ad network are, are you using right now? Are you using ad thrive or Yes, Media? I'm on Ad Thrive. Ad yeah. Thrive, yeah, that's pretty. But good. But I've network. heard good things about Mediavine. I've heard that Mediavine's a little bit faster on your site. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't have any personal testing on that, but I know several people who have switched in the past four to six months that say that they feel like their site. Not that they feel like they can tell that their site speed's gotten faster. Mm. Yeah, no, I, Ad Thrive has been pretty, uh, pretty good with us. But it, like you said, it's, um, it, it's, you know, it can be. A little bit of a slowdown as well, but uh, I think that from what I gather, and I could be wrong. The last time I talked about Ad Thrive and MediaVine, I had someone from MediaVine reach out to me, and they they were like, "Oh, we can we can you know talk all about like what we do, and <laughs> what they don't do," and I may end up doing something like that a comparison. But um, you know, with MediaVine, from what I gather from some of the other you know bloggers in our in our world, um, they just said that MediaVine doesn't pay as much um, in certain I guess markets or niches. So. I think that's going to be a, a by market kind of thing though, right? It's like, you can't really say a hundred percent like what everyone's going to pay across the board. Cause it's always changing. Yeah. And it changes month by month too. And it changes yeah. seasonally, right? With ad buys from 100%. advertisers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think it's probably a very real personal, like whatever works best for your site. Yeah. I don't think and, that one is superior to the other. Well, and I think Mediavine though, they let you start running ads when you're at like 25,000 impressions. And I think ad thrives. Yeah. yeah they, so, that is for sure. Yeah, so and I think Ad Thrive too has a tier. So they start you at 100. But then I think if you're in the, I don't know what the tier is. If it's like either half a million or a million plus page views, then you tier up to another level with them. Oh. And I think it's more profitable. Okay. So okay. I don't know if Mediavine does the same thing. They probably, I mean, they're very, they're very similar. So they yeah. probably have similar programs. Yeah, I'm assuming they would. Um, and Okay, so we, we got to wrap this up. But you're going to be at Brand Accelerator Live in September. So depending on when people are listening to this, we're less than three weeks away, uh, depending on when this airs. Um, but uh, after the fact, uh, you know, probably have some uh, videos or uh, the uh, digital pass available. But Right now, I want to talk just briefly what you're going to be talking about. And I believe it's something to do with amplifying that content that you work so hard on, right? It is. So one of the things that I get asked all the time is, okay, so I wrote this content on my blog or I created this video. Now, what do I do with it? Mm. And what I'm going to talk about at Brand Accelerator Live is easy ways to share that content throughout all the social channels. And I, I have a belief that you should be on all the networks, but you're not going to be phenomenal on all the networks. So you find the two that work the best for you, but you should mm. still be putting stuff out on all of them. But I'm going to talk about easy ways that you can do this, even have the VA do it for you. So it's not something more on your plate. I know a lot of people that are, especially in the physical product business, can't imagine adding something else to their business. But there's some easy strategies that you can use to take that content and push it out on channels. And every network, every social network has a different strategy on what gets people more engaged. So we'll talk a little bit about how to take that same content, make slight tweaks and get it out there so people want to engage with you. Yeah, I love that, right? You like you put a lot of people think it's just content, 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 but it's like create the content and then amplify that content by, you know, sharing it or like you said, adapting it to other, other channels. And I love that. And I know that you are good at that. So I'm excited for you to be able to, uh, to share all of that at Brand Accelerator Live. And not to mention, just you're going to be amongst all of the attendees and stuff. And that's what I really love about Seller Summit is that, you know, you are there with the speakers and you're able to kind of rub elbows and, and talk shop and, uh, and really be able to, to kind of peek inside the minds of some of these other experts that are going to be attending. Now, let me ask you something really quickly. Do you know Alex um, from Travel Fashion Girl? Do you know of her? I know of her. I don't know her. I'm excited to meet her. Yes, she's going to be there. And yeah, uh, yeah, she's crushing it. And uh, she's just, yeah, she's she's phenomenal. She's a firecracker. Uh, She is just like, I I, like I talked at Seller Summit, my my whole uh, presentation was just about the competition. And like, she is like our competition in a sense. But uh, (laughs) But looking at her, you'd be like, oh, she's sweet. Like she, you know, she wouldn't hurt a flea. And then you're like, wait a minute, she wants to win. Uh, and she totally is. But yeah, she's awesome. And I, yeah, you guys will, you guys will hit it right off. But uh, yeah, super excited 
Tony, uh, that we're able to, to finally air this and get this out there to everyone and really talk about content because I do believe that content is a way for you to get attention in your market and also create assets that can continue to give. Like you said, you've created stuff 13 years ago that's still bringing traffic, which is just insane. So it's kind of like planting the seeds and then kind of continuing to pick, you know, from it. And I, yeah. I just think that's amazing. So once again, I want to thank you. I want to thank you also for everything that you do over there at Seller Summit and um, inviting me back year after year. It's always a pleasure. Any last little bits of advice or tips for people that are thinking to themselves, you know what, I want to start creating content, but I'm just not sure how or, or if I should. Well, I definitely think you should. And (laughs) to take from one of my favorite people, I think it's what, take action, right? Yes. Get, get started. Uh, that's, I like to say, get started. Uh, I, like you were saying, you sucked at that video that you made for photography, right? But look at today. It's crazy, right? The change you can make, you'll only be able to get better by doing it. So you've got to get started to begin with and don't worry about putting out junk initially because no one's going to read it. So you have exactly. time to create and get better at what you're doing. And so I think just to get started, and I think the, the real thing to think about before you, the one decision you have to make is what am I good at right now? Am I good mm-hmm. at podcasting? Am I good at video? Am I good at writing? And start there and then let other people do that work for you. Yeah, I, I love it. Absolutely agree 100%. And how can people, if they're not attending Brand Accelerator Live, which they should be, but if they're not, how can people uh, learn more about Tony? Well, good grief. I should say like, you can only get me a Brand Accelerator, right? You should, but, I'm, but, but you don't have to say that because <laughs> not everybody can make it. That's right. I, the best way to get a hold of me, you could shoot me an email, Tony, T-O-N-I at sellersummit.com. And I will be happy to answer questions about the podcast or give you more information. Awesome. Tony, as always, it's been a pleasure and uh, really looking forward to hanging out with you and Steve, which uh, hopefully they'll, uh, you guys will be getting along between the two of you, right? I mean, <laughs> you can always we get should. along, but there's always a lot of smack talk. So it's always fun to watch. Yes, that'll never end. <laughs> All right, Tony, have an awesome day and uh, I'll see you soon in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, there you go. Like I said, Tony has done a lot through the years and I just love hearing the stories of how people get started. And it's just, it's kind of comical that she started on eBay as well. It's, it's funny. I, I see a common thread with a lot of people that get started. It's usually that first sale is either with eBay or now with maybe retail arbitrage with Amazon something like that, or even Etsy. And it's just interesting to hear how people get started and how that light bulb goes off. So just always love to share those stories with you guys. Now, again, Tony is going to be at Brand Accelerator Live, depending if you're coming or not. If you are not, you might want to go over to baltickets.com and you can grab a virtual pass when they're available. And you'll know more about that once you go there and check that out. So again, that's baltickets.com. If you are attending, well, you get to hang out with Tony and you get to uh, go and sit in on her session, which is going to be all about amplifying content, which I'm super excited for her to really drill down into. Now, once again, if you want to grab the show, Show notes to this episode, you can head over to theamazingseller.com forward slash 716, and you can grab all the show notes over there on that page that I've created for you. There'll be transcripts there as well as always. All right, guys, so that's going to wrap up this episode. As always, remember, I'm here for you, I believe in you, and I am rooting for you, but you have to, you have to, come on, say it with me, say it loud, say it proud, take action. Have an awesome, amazing day, and I'll see you right back here on the next episode.